Today we come to Restoration Works number five, and I'm calling this the Lower Dimensions because we'll be discussing the way people, if not careful, will, by their own choices, slip from being God's crowning creation to living life as if they were mere mortals or maybe even mere animals. Since the beginning of civilization, people have recognized that there's a difference between mankind and the animal kingdom. The Bible teaches us that we have an eternal soul, and God holds us to a higher moral standard or to a moral standard that he doesn't hold animals to. I'm wondering if you ever feel like the world has just gone mad. I mean, you hear the news of mass shootings or stampedes or genocide. Have you thought, these people are living more like animals than like mankind. And in his book, The Rest of God, Mark Buchanan shares this story. I never liked the tilt a whirl or whirl a gig, whatever it's called, the thing at the carnival that spins you round and round so that you stagger afterward like a man drunk and blind both. The ground slithers beneath you, the sky twists above. It has discs that whirl clockwise within a larger disc that whirls counterclockwise. The whole thing pitches and heaves worse than a dinghy in a hurricane. It's like a torture implement of the Middle Ages, one of those things with pulleys and levers, with ropes and manacles and great cog wooden wheels. It, it's a thing barbaric and exquisite all at once, operated by a fat man grown bored in a sadism. It makes me queasy just to watch. I did it once. I watched, and it convinced me as though I needed convincing never to go near it. This one was called the Mad Hatter. You wedged in five or so people on a circular bench molded inside a giant teacup. The teacup swiveled on its dish, and the dish swiveled on its base, and the base turned and tilted wildly. I watched a group of four girls go on it and sit together in this single teacup. They were strapped in snug to the hard seats, and the machine started up slow at first. Then with a jerk, the teacups began to back eddy. Everyone yelped, and the whole awful contraption built up speed and flung the riders faster and faster, forever faster, in wide, dizzying circles, and their screams scattered windward with the motion. One of the girls wasn't doing well. Her face was taut with anxiety. Her eyes were shut, and she gripped the handlebars in front of her with a dead clutch, and he, she pushed her body close into the seat. The other girls around her were oblivious, laughing with each swoop and whoosh of the ride, tilting their heads out so their hair whipped hard in the wind. Every time their teacups spun into view, the scene was the same, only a little bit worse. The laughing girls with their fanfare of hair and their horrified, mortified companion. Her, her face was flushed red at first, then blanched white, then shaded green. And then she threw up. A great sparkling arc of spew that gushed upward and boomeranged backward and spattered the inside of the teacup like those paintings you could do in another part of the carnival where you dropped gobs of bright acrylic into the vortex that flung the paint and stringy spatters onto the canvas and you came away with something that looked like one of those Jackson Pollocks. But this was no artwork. This was rock opera. This was Roman carnival. This was the Rocky Horror Picture Show in 3D. This was enough gore to cure you of sheep thrills for several lifetimes. The girls stopped laughing. I had to turn away. Now, this happened a long time ago, but I've never forgotten it. I wish I could. It's become a kind of metaphor for me, that whirligig, the Mad Hatter. It's become a symbol, symbol of of the power of amusement that makes us sick. Pleasure can be like that, a thing that spins you round and round faster and faster. Some people enjoy it immensely, at least for short bursts. They lean into it. Others aren't doing so well. 
Of all the ways our culture spins dizzy, its obsession with food is one of the most glaring, honestly. We are a mad hatter culture, a, a nation of gluttons and weight watchers. Go into any gas station, food mart, and see for yourself. Magazines, rafts of them depict men and women with bodies of impossible tautness and hardness and litherness and lightness, rather. The, the women are felty and buxom with incandescent skin. They gaze out at you brazen as harlots or coy as schoolgirls. The men are stone-faced, all of them grim as though bent on some mortal quest. Their bare stomachs and armor plate of muscle, their arms all sinew and veins. Those pictures are arrayed next to shelves laden with chocolate bars, tubs of candies, shrink-wrapped trays of mini donuts, racks bulging with bags of chips and cheesies and nachos, walls of refrigerator stuffed full of creamy, sugary drinks. And that's not all. Besides the magazines with our pantheon of beautiful people are other magazines that have on their covers photos of succulent, sweet-drenched desserts, casseroles, dense with sauces and sausage and cheese, or, or mounds of pasta tossed in rich cream sauce, bejeweled with shrimp and scallops. Details on page 70, the cover announces. Invariably, somewhere on the same cover, in an insert at the top right-hand corner, maybe is a picture of a woman in a tight dress or a skimpy bikini. And she does it justice with the caption beneath, how to lose 10 pounds and rid yourself of unsightly cellulite before the beach weather hits. Page 71. Go up and pay for it, and there at the counter, next to the till, are several paperbacks on various diet fads, and usually a few dessert cookbooks, next to baskets bristling with chocolate treats. We're a culture stuck between Barbie and Bulge. We dream thin and live fat. We spin this way, we spin that way, back and forth, round and round, and some of us aren't doing so well. My question to you today is, how well are you doing? Are you tired of fighting, of fearing, of, of competing, of, of feeling inadequate, of always trying to measure up? I'm wondering, could it be that God is unsettling you with your current way of life so he can take you up to a place with more meaning, of more purpose, of more dignity? Maybe God is calling you up to a higher dimension. Let's talk about that. Mankind was meant to be decent, but there are times and cultures where man seems to dip into the lower dimensions. Some analogies of dimensions might help you, so let's just talk about them here. In math or geometry, you have a point or dot, and then there's the line. That line represents a single dimension. Then there's a plane. If you don't only go width, but you go height or up. You have a whole page. It's, it's a whole other dimension. There's infinitely more possibilities in a two-dimensional figure than a one-dimensional figure. And then if you go up, length, width, height, you have a cube. Now it's even many more times, many more possibilities. There's three-dimensional figures that they can be tall, they can be wide, they, there's so much more. Or let's talk about dimensions of life. You can, you can start with your own personal life, and then you can move out to the dimension of your house, and then there's your block, and then there's your town, and then there's your country. Different dimensions in life. Brother David Sanzo wrote a book called The High Places. And in that book, 
he identifies seven dimensions of life. Over the next couple of lessons, I'd like to explore those seven dimensions. Uh, hopefully you can understand that while we see these in the Bible, uh, the Bible doesn't name these seven dimensions. We've just identified that in the Bible there are people that live at different places, and these seven places have been identified. The first of those is the first dimension, and I'd like to call that the dimension of the bug, as, do, as Sanzo does. Second Peter says this, But these, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. The New Living Translation puts it this way, These false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand, and they, like animals, will be destroyed. Sanzo describes these people as people who have been raised or influenced to live life for the present. We're talking about people who have no higher goals or principles that they live by. People that just live for the weekend, they're just waiting to win the lottery, are trying to get through their work world so they can retire. They consume things into their body, and the, they live life just releasing themselves emotionally and sexually in every way they know how. They're just, just surviving. Not really where God could take them, just surviving. See this? This is a, a board that has been partially devoured by bugs, probably termites or ants, carpenter ants of some kind. Bugs can be very destructive. You may remember the house I told you I remodeled. Well, that house was so infested by bugs that the, the people who sold it had to hire someone to jack up two sides of the house and replace the eight by eight sill beam that went underneath the walls. That was so infested that you could reach into that eight by eight beam and you could pull out handfuls of sawdust where the bugs had destroyed that. Bugs are, are good for the ecosystem, but I'm certainly glad that I'm not a bug. I am a human being, and in spite of all the challenges of being a human being, I don't want to live in the dimension of being just a bug, that first dimension. The second dimension, Sanzo points out, is the dimension of a dog. And I'd just like to read what he said here. A person living in the second dimension of life is dominated by peers, culture, and the need for acceptance. Their behavior, dress, associations are driven by others. They may feel obligated to do right, but they often want to rebel or just impress others. The point is, they are not driven by principles. They are not given to much planning ahead or reflective thought since they have trouble seeing the big picture. As a result, they're consumed by interests in latest events in the lives of actors, entertainers, sports figures, etc. Their entertainment consists largely of soaps and daytime TV. They have trouble with nonfiction and serious discussion. He says that this dimension of living is selfish, and it's kind of a dimension where it's you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, or us four, no more, or if smoke, if smoke isn't coming out my chimney, there's no smoke at all. I mean, you and I have used the phrase dog eat dog. That's what this dimension is about. Think about a dog. A dog, he is better off than a bug. He considers some things a, a bug doesn't consider. When he goes for a walk, he may explore his world just a little bit. He can decide whether he trusts people or other animals. and He can override his instincts to some extent. He can train a dog a little bit. They, they can understand fire is hot, hot and stay away from it. Well, a bug will just sometimes fly right into it. A dog's in a little bit better situation because it can learn to sit and stay and obey simple commands. In fact, you can... You can put a piece of meat on a well-trained dog and make him stand still and not go for that meat until you give him a command. He's got a little bit more control. He can be loyal. He can be trained to help others. I mean, we have seeing eye dogs and comfort dogs, sniffing dogs, watch dogs. They can be motivated, but it's still pretty simple. You give them a 
something to eat and they'll do what you want them to do. They can be a friend. They can play. I'd like you just to, in your mind, look around at our society. What do you see? How are people interacting with one another? Are they courteous to one another in general? Are they respectful? Do they value human life, the life of the unborn? Have they cheapened physical intimacy with one another? Are they preoccupied with food and games and parties? And how many people, when you look around, do you see that are selfless and generous? That's because a lot of people are living just below where they should in the life of a dog. That brings us to the third dimension. The third dimension is the dimension of man. Again, Sanzo says a person operating in the third dimension of time and space, the dimension of knowledge, is primarily interested in food, sex, and survival. However, they also desire a vibrant social life and intellectual stimulation. Living in this dimension, he says, includes exploration of worlds beyond, oceans, space, and faraway cultures. At this level, one begins to figure out how things work. They're no longer just driven by instincts or the need for approval. They're motivated and fulfilled by higher ideals. People begin to find purpose in this dimension. So people who are living in this third dimension, they can set goals and they can get organized. They can build businesses. They can run cities. They can learn from history and they can protect the future somewhat. Their relationships can survive difficult situations. They can have networks of friends and uh, loyalties and live by ethics and they can ha have support groups and appreciate the needs and the abilities of other people in their life. So some of us, or most of us, probably live somewhere in that second and third dimension until God comes along in our lives. Remember, uh, just like someone in the third dimension of of math can still go back down to the first dimension of math. Uh, same thing can happen in real life. You can live in lower dimensions and move to higher dimensions and still kind of spend some time in the lower dimensions if you're not careful. But if, if we're in that first dimension, we're kind of trapped with the desires of our flesh. When we move into that second dimension, we start understanding right from wrong. But when we go to this third dimension... We're conscious of decisions and, and we can break habits and we can learn to establish other habits and other disciplines. So we've moved from this self-centeredness to caring about others in our home or on our block or in our town. We've moved from things to people to principles. The third dimension is where mature adults live. Now, if you're living in these dimensions, God can restore you to live in even a better dimension. If you're in the dimension of a bug, God may be restoring some things in you so you can move to the dimension of a dog or to the dimension of a man or even higher dimensions, which we'll talk about very soon. Let's pause and chew on this for a few minutes. Imagine this. Freddie has frosting in his hair, cake in his nose, and with a grin on his face, he lifts a glass to his mouth and drinks noisily, letting milk spill out over his cheeks, down his chin, and onto his new pants. He giggles and gargles and spews more milk across the room. It's his birthday party, and he's having a blast. The problem is Freddie's 24 years old, and he has a perfectly normal IQ, and no developmental challenges. He's just being gross. For the most part, our culture doesn't tolerate that kind of behavior from adults. And thankfully, our society still imposes enough peer pressure to keep this kind of behavior from becoming the norm in our public restaurants and in our work lunchrooms. Manners and consideration for others is what separates mankind from the rest of the animal world. However, that separation is not automatic. It's 
a gulf that would disappear if you and I, mankind in general, would choose to abandon common courtesy or decorum. Great empires and cultures have come and gone. There appears to be a trend. When a group of people work hard to live with dignity and decency the way God intended, their culture excels. When ensuing generations begin to disregard the principles that ensured success and that culture begins to degrade, then they as a people group begin to act more and more like animals instead of men. The pain and the destruction that follow are often blamed on God. But in reality, they're the result of men who are abandoning the manners and the morals that the Almighty God prescribed. Peter explained it this way in 1 Peter chapter 4. Since Christ suffered and underwent pain, you must have the same attitude he did. You must be ready to suffer too. For remember, when your body suffers, sin loses its power, and you won't be spending the rest of your life chasing after evil desires, but will be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of these evil things, the godless enjoy sex, sin, lust, getting drunk while at wild parties, drinking bouts, and the worship of idols and other terrible sins. Of course, your former friends will be very surprised when you don't eagerly join them anymore in the wicked things they do, and they'll laugh at you in contempt and scorn. But just remember that they must face the judge of all, the living and the dead. They'll be punished for the way they've lived. That's why the good news was preached, even to those who were dead, killed by the flood, so that although their bodies were punished with death, they could still live in their spirits as God lives. He goes on to say, the end of the world is coming. Therefore, be earnest, thoughtful men of prayer. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, and for love makes up for many of your faults. Personally, I'm thankful for people in my life who taught me to shower, to brush my teeth, to, to keep my feet off the table, to chew with my mouth closed. I'm, I'm even more thankful for those who taught me to respect my body, my friends, and my God. They taught me to treat men and women with respect and to recognize the dignity in absolutely every life. They warned me that life is what I make it. And when I get sloppy, life quickly degenerates. They help me to see that self-control, hard work, and diligence may be harder in the short run, but they are what make for a life of dignity and decency. Before finishing tonight, your group leader is going to give you the opportunity to talk about some people who have had a positive influence on your life. This would be a good time to lift your eyes and begin believing that God is going to take you to higher levels of living.